Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Ilse Samarripa and this is The World Space. Today we have a very special guest joining us. His name is Kyle Figgins. He's been a character animator in some of the biggest companies like Digital Domain, Framestore, MPC, and currently he's working in ILM. He has worked in many different areas, gaming, commercials, feature film, and he is very strong not only in animation, but in rigging to dynamics, scripting, and previous. Working in projects like Oblivion, Ready Player One, Aladdin, King Arthur, Spider-Man Far From Home, Doctor Strange, and many others. Hey Kyle, thank you so much for being with us here today. Hey Elsa, no, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. No, the pleasure is ours. Can we start by discussing your incredible animation of the giant snake in King Arthur? Because the serpentine method is very hard to achieve for animators. I wanted to ask you, what was your workflow to get it done? Workflow, technically, to make it not look like it was sliding on a path, just took a lot of planning. Uh, it was effectively how the snake was animated for most of the shots, but sometimes you animated the curve to find ways to make it look like it was holding here and then pushing here, or working not only in the camera, but also the perspective view. So it really felt like it fit within the space, but it physically fit within the, the rather small chamber that it was in. So that way, when you were looking through the camera, you saw really nice curves and the snake was really filling the space. So. That was really, uh, you know, some of the more framing aspects, but in terms of tools, uh, the rig was really robust and they did an amazing job with that. So hopefully that, that shines through. But uh, I wrote a toolkit to help select the various layers of controls, but also build various pathing tools to help us get, get it into either the pose that it was in or pre-roll to help with simulation. Uh, one of the more prouder moments that I had was writing a tool that if you drew a curve, it would snap the, either the entire snake or selected controls to that curve so you could make appealing curves in the frame and snap the rig to it and be like does that work and kind of blend between so that was really cool it was a really fun project and you know, i was thrilled with how it turned out so glad you liked it and i remember you actually telling me that your lowest grade in school was rigging how did you learn more about rigging i feel like there are many online animation classes but not so many rigging oriented ones is there a rigging program or any books or any learning method that you would recommend? So I actually learned rigging uh, from my first boss, Chris Adams, when I was in, uh, when I took my first child out of school at TKO Software. It was a small game studio in Texas. Uh, yeah, working under Chris pretty much gave me the foundations that I understood of rigging and scripting but also problem solving. Uh, he taught me quite a bit, like if you're having to do something more than three times, you should automate it. Uh, but also like his rigs are the real foundation of what I used for my own rigs because I really enjoyed their functionality and, and how it actually, you know, you're able to animate very cleanly and very quickly. And he was more than willing to, to share his information and knowledge with me. And I couldn't be more appreciative of the, of the time we spent together. Uh, we ended up working on a bunch of projects afterwards and he stays a close friend of mine to this day. And, an incredible wealth of knowledge so yeah but uh beyond that after I, I worked with him the next job i took was at another game studio and again animators built their own rigs for their own creatures and it's for an mmo so there was humans there was aliens there was monsters so there's just a lot of different rigging and even though that was in 3d studio max you got to see how different animators built different rigs for different instances so I try to take the bits and pieces that I enjoyed of everyone else's rigging approaches and try and figure out why it worked or why I liked it. In terms of where I would recommend trying to learn it, uh, Rigging Dojo on Twitter is a fantastic resource. They have workshops and, and training there. It's fantastic. Uh, Noman DVDs and workshops as well. Very fantastic tools uh, and workflows. Uh, silly as it sounds, Google a lot. Uh, you know, someone has written a tutorial or, or a breakdown or a blog post about a problem that you're having, so do check that out. Uh, 3D Total has a wonderful Maya rigging where it breaks down over, I think, nine steps of how to just start a rig. So that'll at least get you going. Uh, but also what I found, you know, obviously this is how I approach it, but really ripping apart existing rigs. Even though you may not fully understand how they did it or why they did it, using what you see in someone else's finished work and using that as a guide about like why are the controls shaped like this why is this getting done with it? why are the joints here or not here for example uh just seeing how other people accomplished it and try to reverse engineer it break it apart rebuild it it probably won't work but you'll at least have a better understanding about how it could work or a goal to achieve 
And if nothing else, you can try contacting people straight up and then asking it, you know, very specific questions. But uh, yeah, so I mean, there's resources out there, but you know, it, it, there's no there's no shortcut in terms of like building and understanding your rig is, is one phase, but also making sure it's animation friendly and clean and fast. There's a lot to learn, so yeah. Keep at it, keep plugging away. Wow, I find it super interesting that you are a great rigger and a great animator as well. How has the knowledge of animation changed the way you approach rigging now? With the experience you have, what do you look for in a rig? Ah, cool. Uh, from rigging to animation or animation to rigging, um, I realized that animators will stare at the rig for hours and hours, day after day. So spending a little bit of extra time to make it clean, clean lines, the controls are colored, there's some sort of way of toggling the visibility of accessories and facial controls and you know anything outside of, you know, obviously you want the rig to be fast, that's paramount. But spending a little extra time to make it look pretty. Uh, it, it really helps not only the single animator, but also the entire animation team. But if a, someone is starting the rig for the first time, you know, seeing hundreds of controls can be very overwhelming, not to mention trying to test each one. Uh, I personally enjoy the uh, action figure approach to rigging an animation where the first time you see it, it should be like, oh, there's a body control, there's the head, the arms, the legs, pretty much the controls that are going to be doing the heavy lifting. So I really try and just make it so when you open a rig, what you see will get you, you know, most of the way there. And as you need more, it's easy enough to turn on the additional controls. You can have that, you know, advanced setup or accessories or faces without being too overwhelmed. That's great. So do you like more simplicity of controls or enough features to support different animation types? In terms of what I actually like to see in a rig when I first open it personally, uh, it really depends on the character. Uh, if the character has to do something specific, like a robot needs to transform, or uh, a knight that needs to swing a sword, uh, you know, anything else like that. If it needs to do a specific action, I try to find out that, oh, it can, you know, it has the controls to move these bits or, or you know, reposition this armor or anything else like that. Usually you can achieve this by finding, you know, a few key poses if the character needs to do, you know, a very iconic pose like a Spider-Man, you know, crouch or something to that effect. You know, does the rig support this? Does it allow these options? If not, can you talk to the rigger to get that fixed? Other ones being like, is it performing well? Is, is the bind en enough so you can get clean poses? Is it fast enough so you can do play playbast or at least real-time playback? If not, is it reasonable? You know, that sort of thing. So it's really just an open evaluation about where you think the character needs to go and then where the shots need to go. So I try to keep that in mind, which is helpful, but it can be, you know, overwhelming at times where, you know, you have new rigs from various people or various projects and you know continuity between them each one can be different so when i build my own i try and keep it as consistent as possible so that you know if you open my rig again it's similar enough that you can hopefully hit the ground running what do you consider to be an advanced human rig what do you think and imagine will come next in terms of setup oh yeah an advanced rig is kind of a weird topic for me uh i kind of a lot of people seem to think that an advanced rig should have everything, like every deformation, everything can stretch and squash and everything else like that. Uh, I really don't believe that in, that in that sense. I believe a rig should be complex enough so that the animators can get the results quickly and effectively. And then I think the, uh, the extraneous bits or the extra should come afterwards from other departments. Uh, creature simulation, muscle, fur, skin, simulation in general, like cloth shot sculpting for for that but trying to build everything into a rig can be really daunting and just slows it down that being said i do believe an advanced rig or, or, or a complex rig should be able to be you know run at real time or as close to it as possible uh have some sort of low res proxy in case you have multiple characters in your scene but uh then for the render mesh or some sort of you know uh, higher res mesh seeing some sort of you know, volume preservation or deformation setup so that you can actually see relatively a good idea about how strong your poses will be or how long strong your silhouettes will be uh you know it's it's not much but it does you know make a difference that this is what i think should be encompassed into every rig but also like if it's going to be an advanced setup it should be built by a script so that it's consistent and can be built again if you know things need to be changed or, or carried on to the next rig. 
but also like naming schemes staying convention, uh, staying consistent, axes staying consistent for animation mirroring or transfer. Uh, these are just functionality things that you know it, it, you feel it when it's missing, and for me that makes a, a rig fairly advanced there. Uh, in terms of the future of rigging, uh, I really it's kind of rigging slash animation, but. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more in-scene dynamics or like character accessories or dangly bits or cloth even so to some cheap level so you can just start seeing it i think clients are going to start expecting it sooner or later kind of like how uh, viewport 2.0 and maya started having anti-aliasing and motion blur and alien inclusion it's really hard to go back to it now that you've seen what it can look like so uh, yeah, I really do think just start seeing you know more complex characters having more complex motion that the animators aren't hand keying like ponytails and, and flaps and whatnot. Uh, the next one probably uh, some sort of motion capture from 2D references. I think the amount of uh, references that animators shoot on their phone or that they find online, there's going to be some sort of like AI or algorithm that's going to allow you to get some sort of proxy skeleton or even like some connect data to just get something you're seeing that's similar. And I think rigging will be able to transfer that to the rig fairly straightforward. Uh, I'm really excited about that because of just how much video reference I shoot personally for my animations. And then uh, lastly would be pretty much the, uh, the VR scene, uh, quill animations and, and whatnot where they're, they're almost doing away with the rig entirely unless sculpting it almost like a stop motion kind of hybrid in, in vr and i'm really excited to see how that goes because just seeing what they've done so far is just very creative and very expressive and i'm really interested to see what happens uh, with the next generation getting into animation without having to deal with overly complex control rigs so yeah i think those would be kind of fun wonderful thank you for sharing that so other than the poly count or the density of the mesh, are there main structural differences between game rigs and feature rigs and BFX rigs? Cool. So the differences between those three types of rigs, which obviously they're different genres in general, but uh, typically for games, you're going to need a rig that can actually be exported or the animation to be exported to the game engine. So that's the, the biggest thing about that. It's not only the performance, but also how the work will be put to the next phase. So usually the, the, the rigging solutions are between joints and blend shapes and usually just joints in general because those are handled pretty well. Uh, but I mean, how the joints are manipulated, it's, it's the same control rig that will be used throughout. I mean, you'll have IKFK and pinning and stuff like that. So, I mean, a game rig can be very complex. It's just the output is usually restricted to, to joints and blend shapes. Whereas a, a visual effects rig might have multiple departments that come later on that's not implemented into the rig itself. So muscle simulation, shot sculpting, hair fur, whatever else may not be visible in the rig itself that you're actually animating on, as opposed to if you're working on a game asset, you may actually be able to see the final output or hopefully you'll be able to. Whereas a film, you'll have other departments you know, adding their own uh, you know, work on top of it. So what you submit as an animator might not be the final result that you see turning out because of the results of simulation or, or um, other departments there. In terms of feature rigs, uh, that's a lot more about shot sculpting or the animator being able to shot sculpt. Uh, so their silhouettes are so important about you know the, the curve of the lines or the eye line or just how much they're distorting the face through the stylization of the performance that the animators needing control over those exact like per pixel per vertex kind of deal is very useful, but it's not really as utilized as much in visual effects and games as it is in a, in a feature animation where uh, visual effects and games are more grounded and more realistic in that sense and feature animation really takes that style and pushes it to the nth degree to make it really really appealing there so yeah i think the the difference is you know you're, you'll always have a core rig but at the same point it's really what comes after it is where they uh, they start to, to deviate wonderful so as the creator of 3dfigins.com your web page and your store where you have models tools great rigs. I have played around with your rigs and they are super neat. What drove you to start that? What are some plans you have for the future? Cool, thanks. Uh, glad you liked them. Uh, it's always exciting to see where people actually, uh, you know, take them with that and actually see what they animate with them. So it's really cool to see where they go. Uh, I started actually hosting rigs about four years ago. Uh, it was right before my son was born. So uh, 
kind of wanted a source of secondary income that I could work on while he slept. Uh, didn't really want his first memory of me to be, you know, working on a computer and ignoring him. So uh, a buddy of mine at the time had just finished a, a personal project that he had done using one of my rigs. So he's like, oh, you should, you should start selling these. It might be able to help you out. And, uh, you know, at first I kind of, kind of blew it off, but then, you know, as the date got closer, I'm like, yeah, that might actually be a pretty, pretty cool thing. So I took the, the rigs that I had for my own personal projects at that time and started it out. And then ever since then, I've been reaching out to more and more modelers and, you know, trying to get a more robust set out there so that people can have more to play with. Uh, at least now my son gets to see his dad and, you know, the animation community gets to actually have some new toys to play with. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, in terms of where it's going to go next, uh, just keep kind of putting out more and more rigs. Uh, I would like to get more creatures and more you know, different types of bodies and, and you know, different, like, not so much always bipeds or, or quadrupeds, can do, but actually like creatures and monsters and gargoyles and stuff. So I think that'll be really fun to work with. It's just, uh, yeah, see where it goes. Great, thank you for sharing that with us. Now, I want to discuss something with you. You are blind in one eye and I think that's very inspirational because even though you don't have stereo vision, you're an incredible 3D artist. Has this ever represented a big challenge in your career? <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of a fun one. Uh, when I was six years old, I had a three inch wood thorn go through my left pupil. Uh, yeah, so I lost the vision out of that eye and I've had a few surgeries to try and get it back, but it's pretty much there for show at this stage. I mean, the vision's kind of there, but it can't get focused enough to see the, uh, the the two images in like stereo, for example, like you mentioned, or in uh, VR, like I can't deal with the screens that close. Even I've kind of a, a hard time reading uh, like really thick text or, or, or novels, stuff like that, it just gives me a headache kind of deal. So I wouldn't so much say that it's a, it's a career hindrance because most of the work I do is still on a monitor and luckily the monitors just keep getting bigger and bigger. But, uh, you know, the, the work is fine for, for what it is. Uh, I think the largest hurdle, like specifically to animation that I hit, was when I was working on 47 Ronin, the film was actually being worked on in stereo as opposed to a post-conversion. And uh, we had dailies in the auditorium with stereo glasses on. I'm like, I can't see this at all. So uh, just had to get more explicit notes about how the arrows were lining up, you know, whether it was the left eye camera or right eye camera. So it was pretty straightforward. But uh, yeah, uh, hopefully uh, that, that, that continues that way. But uh, yeah, not too bad. Can still can still make stuff move pretty well. Well, congratulations, because you've not only overcome that, but you've also succeeded so much. Now, tell me, what do you enjoy the most about being a lead? What has being a lead taught you? So I've had the opportunity to work under some amazing leads in the past, and you know they, they really changed my my view of how a project or, or a team could be led. And I try and you know recreate that in my own teams moving forward. Uh, I really felt in the past that my leads really set me up to succeed. Like they knew what I was personally interested in. They knew the types of shots that I liked, and they generally knew my strengths as an animator. So they tried to assign that accordingly, and I try to rec re recreate that with my own team, getting to know them you know, what their interests are, if, they're, if they enjoy a particular type of shot, or if they want to avoid others, knowing that can really, you know, create more, more of a steady workflow and, and just get shots out that people are, are personally vested in. And I think that's great. Uh, outside of that, just creating templates, tools, processes, anything else like that, so that as much work can be taken off them or repetition so that they can just focus on the performance, just make the best animation possible. But also when, when you see someone struggling or fighting the rig or tools or presentation, you know, th that's time ill spent. So if I can take that off them and improve the workflow of not only them, but hopefully the entire team, all the better. Hopefully we can get across the finish line sooner than later. And, you know, people are happy with the, uh, the work that they've done. Uh, in terms of being a lead itself, uh, I really enjoy personally the fact that, you know, outside of, you know, seeing my team cross the finish line, uh, just having more visibility on the sequence or the show in general, it kind of helps you get in the mind of the, of the characters in the film, or at least, you know, what the director and your supervisors are feeling, at least then, so you start giving notes or, or doing your own work. It's a little bit more functional and, and you have that mindset. But uh, also, if I see a shot that I'm particularly interested in, 
uh, I can you know try and put my hat into the ring, try and get that shot assigned to me since I'll probably be doing less shots as a lead, but the shots that I'm doing are either going to be really difficult or ones I'm personally you know excited to do. So at least then, you know, at the end of the show, like my team did well and I got some shots that you know I'm ready to show on my reel. So yeah, it's really fun. I really do enjoy it. I can imagine. Wow. Even though you are a very good lead, you told me before that you would never be interested in being the head of your own company. You have a very interesting philosophy surrounding that reasoning. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about that? When it comes to owning your own studio, I've always felt that I would be a better engine than a better driver. Like I enjoy being a cog in a well-oiled machine creating amazing images. And I still have ideas and stories of my own to tell, but I know I couldn't achieve them either by myself or, you know, I just don't have that in me. But seeing as, you know, someone who spent just as much time honing their skills and their craft and their trade as I have honing mine, and then using that to just take the baton and run with it, all the departments before and after animation, you know, and just making these incredible images because of this huge communal talent all focused in the same direction, it's just awe-inspiring. I love being a part of that team. I love being a part of that loop. And it's just, I have my own stories to tell. I have personal projects for that. But what makes you a good animator doesn't necessarily make you a good businessman. And what makes you, you know, interested in animation doesn't mean you enjoy, you know, the, the business side of that. So I enjoy being a part of a larger studio in the sense that the work that they do is incredible and I enjoy seeing my own work taken to the next level by the other artists involved. So it's a very compelling environment and I hope to stick around and see more work produced that way. That is super interesting. It's been such a great interview. Thank you so much for being a guest in the show today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So yeah, see you around. That was Kyle Figgins, everyone. And don't forget to check out his website, 3dfiggins.com. He has some amazing things, environments, rigs, scripts, and he even has free content. So make sure to check it out. If you like this interview, please give it a thumbs up so I can know and I can keep making interviews like this one. Please share and subscribe so you don't miss any interviews and leave me a comment. You know I answer every single one of them and I'm very interested in making this channel grow. So if you would like me to interview someone in particular, if you have any suggestions for the channel, thank you so much. I appreciate them. And remember, those who endure, conquer. Winston Churchill. Thank you so much for watching and keep making art. You beautiful artist. <laughs>